All right. Hey, I've got it on. How about that? Good morning to you. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Jeremy. That's what my wife tells the grandkids all the time. Be kind. Be kind. Boy, I just seem so loud, Dirk. It's good, Audrey says. Okay. I feel like I need to whisper. <clears throat> Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians. That's chapter 12. We'll spend our whole time this morning in that chapter. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> uh, remind you that um, if you would, to keep the Dagley family in your prayers and in your thoughts and reach out to them. Um, Roy Sr. did pass away uh, Saturday, Friday, I guess it was, Friday or Saturday. Um, so if you would remember them. <clears throat> and I'll just mention I, uh, I'm sympathetic, Lauren, because it's tough to lead songs when they're in masks. <laughs> and the faster ones you sing, the harder it is for us to keep up because we can't get air through that mask. But I'm sure glad to be able to be, able to be here and sing through a mask with you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I guess more than that, anyway, back in August, I uh, had a sermon out of the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> talking about the distinctiveness of the church, and that sermon, like this one, um, very much comes from some thoughts, uh, material I have from James Thompson. Um, he's down at Abilene, or at least he used to be, I believe he's still at Abilene Christian, uh, there, and in that sermon in August, we looked at the church as God's field and God's temple, and especially we talked a lot about the church as God's temple, and about that language and that idea that <clears throat> the focus there was who owns it, and on the church being a dwelling place for God. Not just me as an individual in my heart, the Spirit dwells in my heart, but as the church <clears throat> being a temple, a dwelling place for God, together as a whole. And that these Corinthian brothers and sisters that we read about in this letter, for all the problems that they had, uh, as full of sin, we might say, as they were in that congregation, as full of, uh, maybe we might even say downright folly they were, for all of that, those brothers and sisters did constitute in Corinth the real temple of God upon this earth. And you and I, in our day, we constitute the true, <clears throat> real, uh, actual, whatever word you want to use, temple of God on this earth, and that in that then that tells us that our task is to build that, not to tear that down. All right, today then we move forward to chapter 12 and look at another distinctive, if you will, of the Lord's church, <clears throat> and that is the idea that it is the body of Christ, the reality that it is the body of Christ. And uh, here again, we're going to find a direct challenge to the individualism that is so prevalent in our society. Um, uh, for those of you on the live stream, didn't say good morning to you, but good morning to you as well. But that individualism, the concepts of individual liberty that are so enmeshed in the founding and the last 200 years of this country, we think that way and we bring that thinking to the Lord's church. And of course, there have always been cultural movements trying to move toward a more collective uh, that I suppose there always will be, but up to this point, at least the way I understand things, the individualistic thinking has largely held sway. I don't know what the future holds. I came across in, in my uh, reading the other day um, a site called the Center for Individualism.org, and they have writings on there about things, and I've read a couple of them, and that's kind of the way that I tend to think. But that's not for the Lawrence Church, and this, I think, is much more difficult than the temple concept. <clears throat> chapter 3. Not because it's hard to understand. That's not the issue. It's not hard to understand. It calls on us to be, it calls on me to be an awful lot more when I read this chapter and think about the body uh, and the things that, that's being taught here. It really does, I think, call, it, it's a very high calling for us. And uh, so it's, 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 it's uh, in that aspect, for me, it's kind of a you know, it's a tough chapter. It really, really does stir the thinking around how I'm supposed to relate to you uh, and, and how you're supposed to relate to me. And individualism really is, uh, you know, that idea isn't, isn't found here. Uh, that's not here. Now, some people might get worried, you know, well, where is he going? What's he talking about? Some kind of socialist 
something Marxist thing going to get back into the Scriptures. No, it's not that either. We just want to look at what the text is telling us and get our hands around this idea of the body. And you know that the, uh, the immediate context of Corinth, I won't go over that too much, but you know what was going on there. They had these divisions uh, amongst preachers, preacheritis, you might call it. They had these self-aggrandizement that was going on over spiritual gifts. Well, I've got this one and mine's better than yours and this kind of stuff. They had uh, a lot of selfish pride just manifested in a lot of ways. Those were two ways that I just mentioned. Another way was they were taking each other to court, trying to get the civil court to enforce their individual rights upon other members of the body. Um, they had a problem. You remember just the previous chapter, chapter 11, we read that at the Lord's table all the time. The tail end of the chapter, if you read the first half of the chapter, you see the abuses they had in it. They had the, the have-nots, if you will, over here meeting with the big feast, and then over here in another room, the, 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 the what did I say? The, have, the haves over there. Anyway, you know what I mean. They were separated up uh, by their social and economic standing. And those well-to-do were having a big meal and others were, you know, just scraping by. Uh, that again, you know, all those things are going on here. But, and so we understand he's writing this in that context, but then we have to get a hold of this and put it into our context. And that's where the, the challenges really uh, come through, uh, at least in the way that I, uh, I read it. There's a lot in here about spiritual gifts in this chapter. A lot of them are miraculous. Uh, we don't have those miraculous gifts today, but again, uh, the idea that he's teaching here about the body, uh, just as prevalent, not as prevalent, just as important for us. Uh, and so let's read the 12th chapter, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll make a few uh, comments here about what we read. So he just finished this idea of, hey, you're coming together for the Lord's Supper. That's, you're not coming together for the good. You're actually doing harm. Stop all that. Uh, examine one another. Um, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And he goes on and talks about those things, and he wraps that up. And then he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, which, you know, it, you, you might think, well, he's starting a new thought here, but I, I think it's, it's quite a bit related to the chapters before, but they had apparently asked him about this. So chapter 12, verse 1, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Not a, st a shining endorsement of their life before Christ, is it? But if somebody were to write us a letter, or you an individual a letter, you know what you were before Christ, how you were carried away to dumb and then just fill in the blank, whatever it was. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I think there's a context in Corinth to that, but we don't, we don't need that this morning. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, look in 4, 5, and 6. This is one of those, um, <clears throat> for lack of a better word, I'll say Trinitarian passages where you see the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father uh, linked together. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now that's the way mine reads. Your mains may read a little bit differently. But take note of that verse. These gifts of the Spirit, these manifestations are given to each one individually, but they're for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge to the, through the same Spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one <clears throat> and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit, for in fact the body is not one member, but many. <clears throat> if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Or if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? 
if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, you and I are members, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the hand, head to the feet, I have no need of you, nor much rather those members, excuse me, no, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and on our unpresentable parts we greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. He puts tongues last. You know, in Corinth, there's a reason he puts that last. The varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Rhetorical question. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. And then, of course, he goes into that tremendous chapter, short but tremendous chapter, on love and talking about clanging cymbals and sounding brass if we don't have love. All right, let's just uh, spend a little time here. The first thing on your outline there, now you are the body of Christ. Look at verse 27. You are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. A few weeks ago, we were in Ephesians chapter 2, we were talking about these ideas of reconciliation there and about community there. And, you know, I, I tried to make a point of this. We don't have to figure out how to reconcile to one another. We're already reconciled to one another in Christ. Our task is to live in accordance with that reconciliation. The blood of Christ is sufficient. It's all capable. It will reconcile us back to the Father and to one another. We don't have to. We already are reconciled. We have to live that reconciliation. The same thing is true here in verse 27. He's not telling the Corinthians, you have to become or you have to figure out. No, you are the body of Christ. And you need to therefore so behave as the body of Christ. And that's what he's going to go on and teach them here. For all of their problems, <clears throat> just like in chapter 3, for all of their problems, for all of their uh, sins, specific things, and pride and division, look what it says. Paul says, you are the temple of God back in chapter 3. And here he says, you are the body of Christ. It's not something they have to figure out. Don't need psychology, don't need sociology, don't need modern organizational theories, don't need any of that. You and I, if we're in Christ, we're in His body. We are the body of Christ. That's not something we achieve, something we are, part of our identity, and now is for us to live according to that. Look at verses 18 and 12 and 24. <laughs> How about we do them in order? 12 and 18 and 24. Each one of those verses is going to tell you that the Spirit had already made them the body. The Father had already made them the body. The instruction here is, again, not to become, but to live in congruity uh, in, um, maybe, that's, maybe that doesn't even make sense. Does it in congruity? Anyway, to live in accordance with what God has already done, that identity. Not to create something new, but to live with that. The Corinthians, you'll notice too, didn't get to pick who was in the body, and neither do we. You see that down there in verse 15. You've got Jews and Greeks. You've got slaves and free. You could name a lot of other things. We don't choose any. God composed it, verse 24. He made it. Okay. And they're to live that out. Now, 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 what does that mean to live that out? We're to live that out. Well, a body doesn't divide, so stop it. That's what he's telling the Corinthians. A body doesn't divide, so stop it. The parts of the body are to work in harmony together recognizing that there's different functions, but a unity of purpose. So stop lording over one another these things. Stop attacking one another. Stop with these factions and these parties. Stop taking each other to court. Just all these things you've seen and you see in the book. Stop all that because you're a body. A body has sympathy and care for its members. So stop mistreating 
one another. And so you and I are reminded of these very same things. If we're in Christ, then we're part of his body. It's not we're in Christ and then we decide to... If we're in Christ, we're part of his body. We're not part of his body, we're not in Christ. You can't evade that from this chapter. You cannot separate those those two things, okay? So if we're in Christ, we are part of the body. And so then that carries all of these uh, meanings and instructions for us. Um, On a social note... uh, Thompson was talking about th- this kind of community that you read about in this chapter. That's exactly what uh, people in the first century were looking for. And if your uh, Bible has headings, I'll bet in chapter 12 somewhere, it's got a heading called Unity in Diversity. And that's, of course, what all societies essentially are looking for. It's certainly what you see people searching for in our century, in our time. And you notice what he's saying. God's already composed it. This already exists. What we need to do is submit to Christ and become part of that body. It's not sustained, though, by human wisdom or by human systems, just like reconciliation wasn't. This community is not. And so we're reminded that uh, that Jesus and our Father creates that community, and they sustain it, and we're to live and love and serve within it. And lastly, before we move on, I just uh, try and maybe you might think I'm Move on already, (laughs) but I'm not going to. You notice, we're not like a body. This is not a simile. So Jesus in Matthew 10, 16 says, Therefore be wise in serpents and harmless as doves. We're not serpents and we're not doves. That's a simile. This isn't a simile. We're not like a body. We are the body of Christ. There's a difference there. It's not a social club. Not an association of some kind, political, benevolent, whatever it is, that functions like a body. Not a social club that functions like a body. We are the body. To be a member of that body is different than being a member of some kind of an association. I can be a card-carrying member of some kind of association. We all got our wallets out and started pulling out that stuff we put in there 20 years ago. We would find, oh yeah, this one and that one. And with those associations come a little bit of responsibility and paying your dues and then whatever benefits you accrue from that association. That's not this. We're the body here. We were incorporated into his body through baptism. That's one of the ways. That's specifically mentioned there back in verse 13, which tells us that even that is not a private and individual thing alone. Baptism that saves is the baptism that adds one to his body. Both occur at the same time. Now, the day that you were baptized, there might not have been anyone present, but that's not the point. The point is, this is what was accomplished by it. We were brought into the body. And so even that is not a standalone individual thing. So, all right. You are the body. I am the body. Now there's some realities uh, that we need to think about in that regard. Now, I engineer by trade. So I use the word function. Function, that's what we do. I, I in fact, uh, work more on systems than anything else. So function is all I talk about all day long. So if I talk too much about function, I tried to kind of weed it out here, but I probably say it too much. That, that's just why. But each part has their function. A uh, couple things to note here. The body is one and has indispensable members. And if you think about those societies or associations, I'm, not society, associations I mentioned ago, they tend to be kind of pyramid shaped. And the higher you go, the more important you are. And In the body, though, with the exception of Christ being the head who is to be worshipped, that's not the case. Here in the body, every member has its function or has its purpose, has something to contribute, and that is needful for the body itself. Now, uh, you know, you know, you're bound to find some contrarian somewhere who'll try and strain this uh, too far and say, "Well, you don't need your hair," or "Well, you know, you can cut your fingernails," or. Well, you got two kidneys and you can live with one, but you only got one heart and you can't live without it, so the heart's more important than the body. Just stop that kind of thing, okay? He's teaching us something. This is not about the minimum uh, you need in a body to survive. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the healthy body as God intends for it to be. And in that body, every member has something there to contribute for the good of the whole body. And in a totally healthy body, every member is going to be important. That every member needs to be healthy for the whole body to be healthy. 
uh, you know, this we can understand in that context. And so we can see Paul striking at the division and, and immorality here in Corinth. If they know they are the body of Christ and they should know that gross immorality not only destroys that person's body as the individual, but it's destroying the body of Christ, the community. And if you know that you're the body of Christ, then you know that elevating one over another because of miraculous gifts that he gave one is harmful to the body. It's also irrational if you read the chapter uh, by the way. The members of a healthy body don't turn on each other and attack each other. So in fighting and taking one another to court and these other things, um, are sinful with respect to their identity itself as being the body of Christ. Okay. Well, we don't necessarily have those problems, but I find this to be extremely uh, challenging. And, you know, I don't have to tell you that preachers have problems with this. If you've been a member of the Lord's Church very long, you know that they do. They have a problem with self-elevation. Uh, and some of these other items here, um, you know, not Garth, but, you know, this is an issue. You have to look at it seriously. Those members, we think to be, excuse me, verse 22, no, much rather, the members which seem to be weaker are necessary, indispensable. We don't want to import worldly concepts here. <coughs> So how is this going to play out? Because in any, you know, you just, so let's just think about the pre-COVID world for a minute, okay? COVID sort of scrambles my thinking. Let's think about the pre-COVID world. If you take any congregation, you come in, you do a survey, and you talk to each member individually, you're going to find some who feel like they're unnecessary. They're going to find some who feel like they're on the, um, I don't know if outskirts is the right word, but who just don't, that, that to me, I think, well, let's just, I'll just say it this way. In any congregation I've ever been, which hasn't been many, but in the ones I've been in, that there are people that feel that way. And then there are others who struggle to, with, with that idea of integration and that idea of wholeness. And, you know, you're waiting for me to tell you the answer. I don't have the answer. <clears throat> it's something we have to pray about and work together on. And, uh, you know, just speaking for myself, we have to leave a lot of individuality concepts behind in the body. It doesn't mean I have to change what goes on in the world, but with regard to you in the body, I have to leave a lot of that behind and not allow myself to become isolated. Now, you know, everybody's different. I'm an isolator. <laughs> That's kind of the way I am. If I were an animal, I'd be a turtle. Because if you give me any trouble, I just into my shell. I'll just hang out there till you go away, pop back out and go on my business. That's me, okay? Well, we're not a zoo. We're a body. Challenges there. Okay, the second one, gifts are for the body, not for the individual. That's verse 7 and 11. This one's quite a challenge too. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, as individuals, for what purpose? For the profit of all. Not for the aggrandizement of the individual. Not for the gain of the individual. Not to make that individual closer to Christ. Not for their own spiritual welfare or their own spiritual growth. They're given for the profit of the body. Now, if I grow in my uh, spiritual wisdom, and in that's going to be profitable for the body. I understand that. But look at the purpose that he says they are there for. Now, you know, in Corinth, they had these miraculous gifts. They had problems. They like to show them off. And he's telling them, stop that. Stop that. You only have that gift to edify, to build up for the profit of the body itself. It's not for you. It's for the health, for its function, for fulfilling its purpose. Again, preachers have a hard time with this. You know that. Now, suppose you were in Corinth and you didn't have a spiritual gift. Boy, you would just feel like, well, you know, is there something for me here? And Paul's writing to correct all that. Whatever it is that you and I have, well, before we get to that, a leg can't walk by itself, right? We understand that. A leg performs a function that allows the body to move or to walk. But the leg doesn't walk off by itself. A leg removed from the body, that's going to die. Maybe to say it another way, a leg 
isn't made strong for the leg's sake. A leg is made strong to carry the body. And so gifts were not to exalt. Now, you and I, we say, well, we don't have miraculous gifts and we just run on to the next chapter, right? No. No. Each is given for the profit of all. Not just miraculous gifts. Look, look, look at what he's telling them. Now think about your abilities or capabilities or talents, even your resources. Now we really get nervous when I start saying your resources are there for the good of the body. We really start to get nervous now. <laughs> Wait a minute. He wants to have a common wallet. No, I don't want to have a common wallet. I'm telling you that the things God has blessed you with in your life, whatever that might be, the things God's blessed me with in my life, whatever that might be, has a purpose for the body as a whole, not just for me and not just for you. But if I'm an individualist, if I'm an isolationist, you'll never get the profit, to use the word here in verse 7, that God intended for you to get from what He blessed me with. Now, do you find that to be a great challenge? Boy, I do. I do. And then verse 26, the body united in sympathy, care, and honor. Because we're one body, because God has put us into one body, now our care is for one another. <clears throat> and if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. And if one is honored, all members rejoice with it. I think we have less uh, problem with that concept, but even still, our individualistic um, tendencies, let's say, uh, or maybe in my own case, my isolationist tendencies, let's say, are going to tend to pull me out, uh, mm, sorry, are going to tend to keep me from uh, functioning in the way that verse 25 and 26 talk about. Because I don't know that you're suffering. How then am I going to suffer with you? And I don't know that you're rejoicing. How then am I going to rejoice with you? Because I'm not acting like I'm a member, not acting, wrong word, not living as though I'm a member of the body Christ put me in. I am, he put me there, but that's not, I'm not living that if I'm living that individualistic, isolated kind of a life. I say we're better at this. This is still challenging for me. If I, every week I get a bulletin from Valerie dropped right in my lap, and there's a whole page at least of folks in there. Some of them are suffering. Am I suffering with that long list of people there? Some of them are rejoicing. Am I rejoicing with those people there? Some of them have, you know, there's just, there's a lot of things in there. Um, spiritual issues, physical issues. You, you can see how if you read verse 26 and then pull out the bulletin and look at it, are we really functioning as the body that God made us to be? It's a big challenge, I think. Now, that sounds like a complaint. I'm not complaining at you. I've used myself a lot here, uh, more than you probably want to hear, uh, with regard to my own tendencies. Uh, but I'm just trying to get across to us, once again, the messages here in the Scriptures and the, the quite uh, just very high call that is here for us. So when we think about... Um, yeah, I'm probably not being clear there. Uh, let's see. I don't want to spend too much time, but if, when we were in Ephesians chapter 4, therefore, um, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And when you think of that calling, you think, I think, of the first three chapters there, but this falls into that, we're, we have been made his body, now walk worthy of that identity, and when we think about that, these are the verses uh, that challenge that, uh, for me at least. If one suffers, they all suffer, and if one is honored, they all honor with it. Uh, lastly, then, the body, then, as you read this chapter, does not exist to meet my needs. That's not why it's here. Now, if I have needs because that verse, just go back to verse 26, you're going to help me meet those, but that's not why the body, this is not um, a support organization in that way. We're the body of Christ, and the head defines for us this mission that we have, and that is the reason why we exist. Not like an association where we pay some dues and we accrue some benefits for our own personal needs or uses. That's not the body. The body is, there's a mission, Christ has formed this body, now go fulfill his mission. Doesn't exist to meet my needs. Again, that individualism comes out. 
Well, uh, my time is up for today. If if you if I just if we just think about those headings, we are the body, indispensable members, gifts for the body, not the individual. Maybe gifts isn't even a broad enough word there. I have in the outline. Um, anyway, you know what I mean. Um, and the body does not exist to meet individual needs. If if you it has its own mission that Christ has given it. In that, you can see in that idea, the church is very, very distinctive. Very, very distinctive. But it's also quite challenging for us and quite difficult to think. I should, you know, I don't mean, I need to watch my language. Quite difficult. Quite difficult. Um, it's a challenge to set aside our own priorities and to function as members of the body that God has made us members of. There's teaching to be done. There's praying to be done. There's encouraging and building up to be done. There's evangelizing to be done. There's worshiping together to be done. There's all kinds of service you could list to be done. There's expressions of love, of which everything I've just said is an expression of love, to be done as that body. And I'm just trying to encourage you this morning in those two areas. Number one, the church is very distinctive. We're the temple of God on earth. Not going to build another one. He already built his. We are his body here on earth. Every one of us in that body has a, a place to contribute, a place where we are, to look at verse 22 in my translation, necessary. But in that, we're to serve the needs of the body, not to serve the needs of ourselves. To remind you of those two things, the distinctiveness of the church as a body, and then our responsibilities. Our call is probably a better word to live that kind of a life. I hope that you'll think about those things. I'm trying to think about those things in terms of how you can fulfill your role in serving the body here. You probably have questions about that, specifics, about specifics, I mean. Well, you know, I'm, you know, just Nathan's not here today, but I'll just mention Nathan. He, he, he and I were talking in the parking lot the other day, and he says, yeah, you know, Dave Ingram has is, is, is been going up to the Monroe prison, prison since uh, since Carol, actually before, anyway, he's been doing some prison ministry up there, and Nathaniel or Nathan was saying, well, you know, uh, this is kind of an area where I think maybe I could and write some letters, and so he and David have got together. The, the, the ways in which you can serve the body are endless. If you want to talk about those kind of specifics, uh, by all means, you, you might have questions about that. You know, it's going to sound like I'm passing the buck here. Certainly, you can talk to me. Uh, talk to uh, the elders about that. Talk to the deacons about that. Talk to your brothers and sisters. Um, you know, maybe there's not enough application in this sermon, but I'm just trying to hold up these ideas uh, for us so you can see uh, the challenge that's there and the call that's there. And I hope you've been encouraged in that this morning. Uh, Lauren is going to lead us in a song. Our time is up. If there's something in that chapter that pulls at your heart and you'd like some, some uh, support uh, from your other members of the body, you can certainly make that known today. Uh, you don't have to do it publicly while we're singing, but you can if you choose to. You can also just pull aside a, a member that you love and trust uh, and, and talk about that and, and pray with that, uh, pray about that with them. But we make this opportunity available. And then there might be someone out there listening on the uh, internet or wherever that actually wants to become a member of that body. They've never taken those steps. They've never followed those, uh, that plan that Christ has given to become a member of that body, as Chris did and as uh, uh, the uh, Hasseltons did earlier this year. If that's your desire, if you want to become a member of that incredible body and that incredible temple that we've read about there in chapters 3 and in chapter 12, you can make that known today also while we're standing and